Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Humans and Wildlife show. Um, so that was a little intro I played from Christian, but I just got a comment that I'm not sure if people could actually hear it or not, but if you couldn't hear it, that was my regular co-host, um, Christian Sase, who unfortunately can't be with us this episode. He's actually on um, holiday in Mexico with his wife. They're vacationing, escaping from, um, I guess, the Canadian cold. So Christian um, could not make it today, but we have with us Tristan. Um, so Tristan is a guest from, oh, hang on, let me, why are you not popping up? So unusual. Um, let's see. Okay, okay, there we go, there we go. So Tristan, welcome. Um, so Tristan is Dr. Tristan McKnight and he is an entomologist, so he's a bug expert. And um, he also lived in Russia for a couple of years with which intersects with our topic. And Tristan, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, where are you now? Um, I know you teach some classes related to like humans and bugs. Yeah. So I'm, George and I were in grad school together for a little bit. And so that's how we know each other then from, from then. I'm now yeah. teaching at the University of Arizona. So I'm wearing a shirt from our Arizona Insect Festival. Um, I teach some general education classes about how insects affect human society and culture and all these different ways that insects have been on planet for hundreds of millions of years. And they really run the planet. And so we help people figure out how politics and uh, economics and arts all have links that come from insects and how we can better understand what we as people do and um, and how we are all part of this life. So I love mixing science and humanities that way. And it provides a really good opportunity for us to have a couple hundred students every year learn about these things at Arizona. Yeah. And I, um... So real quick, I just realized that unfortunately it looks like the chat is disabled on YouTube right now. So I'm trying to figure out how to undo the chat disable. Oh, wait, here it is. Um, oh no, it's grayed out. Why can't I enable it? <gasps> this is horrible, sad. I want the live chat on, but it's is literally not letting me do it. I don't know why. I'm so sorry, everybody. It might be one of those things that like you can't, you can't edit it in the middle of the stream. Um, but, okay. Sorry, everyone, give me one second. If you are watching on YouTube and you just wanna leave a comment, hopefully you can comment and let me know if you're able to see anything, I would love that. Um, on Facebook, oh, we do have a comment on Facebook from David Dunn. Can't comment on YouTube. It's on kids mode. Oh, sorry. Gosh, I didn't realize when I was filling it out. I thought that being like on kids mode would mean that it wouldn't like make people um, make, pe I don't know, make, make people like click the age restriction 18 year old thing. So let me try taking off kids mode real quick and see if that helps. I'm so sorry, Tristan. That's okay. Um, no, this movie is, this is not made for kids. Okay. Maybe, and then maybe, so let's save that. And then let's edit. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, everybody. Guess what we got? We got chats on on YouTube. Um, we could restart. No, yeah. So David, go back to um, YouTube. I think you should be able to to comment now in the live stream chat. I'm so excited. Phew! Glad we caught that early. So Tristan, for your information, I guess we do have like several people who I have noticed only watch this live stream when it is insect or bug themed. So we actually have like, we have like a decent amount of like insect enthusiasts. Um, maybe while we're like waiting for people to shuffle around a second. I remember one of the, 
one of the classes that you taught when you were like first transitioning from like grad student to professor, one of the classes was, um, I guess it was like a part of the class you were looking at like Kafka's like metamorphosis or something. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, that's actually one of the classes I'm most proud of. And I, I wanted to do it again. Right after I graduated, I was adjunct teaching at St. Lawrence University. And I made this class where the idea was to orbit around the idea of metamorphosis and change. And so we read Kafka's Metamorphosis, um, which is about a person who wakes up and suddenly they're an insect and how is their life different? And it's very surreal and strange. And how is their family different? And how is their whole life different with that? Um, and then we also read a bunch of Ovid's Metamorphoses, which is an old ancient Roman epic poem about all the different stories of transformation. And then we reared some caterpillars into butterflies so we could do experiments and study like how do things actually change? How do people change? Tried to learn a little bit of psychology about how do people change? So it was a really fun way of trying to see what can we learn from how insects do it? How do people change? We don't necessarily go through metamorphosis the way uh, bugs do, but we do transform a lot. And it was really fun working with students is like they're sharing different ways that they're seeing themselves as a larva or as a pupa or as an adult. Um, I remember I had some students are like, yeah, you know, right now I still consider myself a larva with how I cook because I don't know how to cook very well and I'm just learning that now. But other ones are like, oh yeah, I'm already an adult all the way. I, I know how to take care of myself. And just lots of different ways of trying to approach the world differently. So yeah, we actually, in this room, we had a previous another bug episode that was like learning empathy through insects with the bug chicks and the bug chicks have you heard of them yeah they're two I watched women. episode actually oh so. you watched the episode <laughs> okay so you're kind of doing the same thing but at like i think an older age i don't think they go up through like university level so that you're doing a similar thing at an age a different age range i guess which is super, super cool. Yeah, so in both the Facebook and the YouTube, I just posted um, a link to Tristan's um, sort of like faculty page at University of Arizona. And if you go there, you can like find out more about the classes he teaches and his publications. So it says in your courses taught, you have busy bees and fancy fleas, how insects shaped human history, and also secrets of success, how insects conquered earth, um, which is, I don't know, it's pretty cool. We usually so, get a few students every year who tell us they signed up just because of the title. So we're keeping the titles for now because they're so much fun. Yeah. And real quick, before we so before we get into the potato beetle, I just want to say welcome to everyone now that I can finally see your chats and stuff like that on YouTube. Yeah, Frankman says it's working. Yes, hello, welcome. Um, everyone is everyone is so excited. Frank Gentleman Ghost says, mention Soviet in the title and censorship is in effect. <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah, David Howden says, ah, now we can distract you in the chat. Yes, just like that. We have um, fans of some enthusiasm for Kafka. Um, David Dunn says, Georgia looks so much lighter since the weight of her thesis is off her shoulders. Yes, I turned in my thesis last week, the sort of initial draft to the committee and stuff, and then they'll grill me on it next week. <laughs> so I'm in the, the sort of middle right now. Um, David Howden says he suspects he's a larva infested with a bunch of parasitoids. How unfortunate. Um, yeah, so so let's back up real quick. And well, I didn't look at the Facebook. The Facebook is often less active. Um, no super interesting comments on Facebook. That's fine. Um, so, sorry, the only people that commented on Facebook are basically me and then people being like, the chat isn't working on YouTube. So we got it sorted out, everyone. Thank you. Um, so Tristan, let's, let's go back real quick. So briefly before you joined this, um, you shared with me a meme. So um, let me pull up. Okay, you shared this with me. Um, oop, welcome back. So someone texted this to you, I take it. Um, but they shared it on Facebook. They shared like, it on Facebook. Okay, can you read this? Uh, so in Russian it says, Shta Colorado всех жуков из России, which means the state of Colorado is recalling all their beetles from Russia. Interesting. And this is something that was shared recently, right? 
last night. Last I night. The screenshot. I was like, I have to save this. So this is related to the Colorado potato beetle thing. So like people in Russia still know about the Colorado potato beetle. Probably people in Colorado don't know about it, I suspect. We're like, what? So I guess to like kind of get us started here. Um, and I do want to get more into like where I want I do want to get more into like, as I mentioned, you lived in Russia. You have made a career and a life around studying insects. Um, that's all very interesting. And hopefully we can learn more about like kind of why that is and why you like insects or how you ended up in Russia as we're going through this. But I know that you have, you teach a class about this Soviet propaganda with the Colorado potato beetle thing. And so we have some slides here that we can go through. Um, I do wanna, let me just see if there's a better way to share these slides real quick. Um, I also just realized I, that version looks like it has the audio links on it. So if you need a okay. version that won't autoplay audio, I can send you that too. Oh. Are you, is this like some kind of Mac thing? Cause it hasn't, it hasn't been playing audio. Ah, well then. It just kind of goes like that. Oh, it's PDF. So then those are the extracted slides. So they shouldn't play audio. Okay. okay. Yeah. The, for some reason that's how it shared it with me. And I think it might be, oh, I think this is a little bit. Ooh, oh, that looks good. This looks good. Yeah. Okay. Um. Colorado potato beetle and global domination, insects and food production. Would you like me to go to the next slide or you want to talk about this? I feel like there's a lot going on here. Yeah, unfortunately this, so I use my slides kind of as my textbook. And so they're a little over crammed with material, but this, I, I designed this, this lesson actually, no one had done it before at my university. And I was like, I've got to throw this stuff together because I love all this. Yeah. But uh, so in the first one, the left is the Colorado potato beetle. That's the subject we're talking about today. On the right is an example of one of many, many political cartoons you can find or propaganda things that are linking the US and imperialism with these beetles of destruction, basically. And so we're gonna see how this has been interpreted in lots of different ways throughout history. Yeah, and I loved how you described this as like, I'm gonna, I'm giving away the ending probably, but you described this Colorado potato beetle as like, an ecological bomb that's still exploding to this day, which I just love. Okay, so potatoes, it's part of their name. What's the deal with potatoes here? So potatoes, I'm just trying to set the stage. Potatoes are important, you know, they're, they're these really cool plants. They're part of the same family that gives us really, really toxic stuff like nightshades and tobacco and belladonna and stuff. You know, we use these as eye drops because they paralyze your eyes. Um, you can poison somebody with them. So they're really toxic, but they also have some really great foods like eggplants and tomatoes and potatoes. Um, and potatoes and themselves are native to somewhere in South America, or is that later? Yeah, in the Andes. Um, the Andes. Peru often, I think, is like the heart of potato, true potato world, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so the fact that they both are they've got all these good foods, but they've also got all these toxins. It's going to tell us that evolutionarily, there's going to be a lot of pressure to, for these plants to defend themselves because there's, everybody's going to want to eat all these good foods. And so mm. they need all these toxins to help defend themselves. Everyone meaning not just, uh, not just people, but bug people as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Potatoes, lots of potatoes and whoop, I might have went too far. Oh yeah. There's like a picture of them. They look great. Um, <laughs> we can skip through some of this. It's just saying yeah, potatoes no, are fine. important. Oh, this I like this. Well, I guess this map. Okay, so this many people know this, right? Okay, so this potato beetle has like a sort of life cycle similar to a lot of insects. It can be an egg. It's a larvae. It's a pupa, and then it's an adult. Correct. Okay. Yes. I wasn't entirely sure. Sounds good. Ooh, what's going on here? So go back to the last slide just for a second okay. there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. When we first described the potato beetle, so I've actually got a copy of the original description back in 1823, where some of these early American entomologists are going out doing these trips in Nebraska and, and Iowa, and they're just collecting all the beetles they can and describing them. And when they did that, they found this beetle and they described it. It's one of hundreds of beetles that they described. And it 
nobody had potatoes there yet because potatoes were from the Andes. Then when the Europeans colonized the New World, they took them back to Europe, eventually got Europeans eating them, and then they had to reintroduce them to North America. So the Colorado potato beetle actually as a species had never encountered potatoes until the mid 1800s. I think that's so weird. And like, yeah, I kind of gleaned that from looking at these maps. I think it kind of shows it in a couple maps I noticed. Maybe it's like at the very end. <laughs> so I'm like scrolling through. This is like a preview. It is like yeah. this map that I really drove home for me. So like origin of potatoes here, like in the Andes in South America. Origin of the Colorado potato beetle here. Is this like central Mexico kind of? Northern Mexico, yeah. Okay. And then current distribution of the potato beetle and potatoes. I get potatoes are kind of everywhere now. Yeah. So like, it's so crazy to me that this insect that we have potato in the common name, it, it isn't even, it, it didn't even, it doesn't know anything about potatoes and its true evolutionary roots. It's just kind of like became something that took advantage of potatoes. And David Howden has a really good comment in the chat here. He said, I think potatoes have toxins too, but the fatal dose for humans is pretty high. Yeah, so you're that's also correct, probably, I'm sure. We're in some ways talking about this in a very human-centric sense, even though um, obviously maybe we should be thinking about more in a, a bug, human, plant-centric sense. Anyways, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, sorry, I'll go back to your... Oh, okay. Giving away the ending. So the, the beetles were eating another species of plant that's in the same genus as potatoes, but that does live in northern Mexico and in the Rocky Mountains called buffalo burr. And so that's what they ate mm -hmm. as, as a species that had evolved. Then if you click forward to the next one, 1820s, we start to see uh, settlers moving west and they bring potatoes with them because we like eating potatoes and they start farming potatoes. And since it's in the same genus as the buffalo burr, the potato beetle is like, well, you know, we could try finding all these random little buffalo burr plants that are spread across the wild, the, the landscape, or we can just go to these farms where people are literally growing a very closely related food and eat that. Yeah, and I am, I just looked up a picture of buffalo burr and this appears to be it, um, which, yeah, that's a pretty cool looking plant. Okay, anyway, sorry. Do you want the next slide? So it took about 40 years of getting enough people there, having enough beetles that have mutations, and then they switched host. And so then they started eating potatoes, but most people still, there weren't very many farms yet. And so they couldn't spread very far. And so if one or two potato beetles started to eat potatoes, they couldn't spread very far until we hit the 1850s, 1860s, when with the next slide, we start seeing Civil War, uh, Homestead Act, all sorts of stuff. People start moving west in thousands and thousands and they start putting farms every few miles away. And so then the beetles can start to spread from potato farm to potato farm and they just sweep across America. Um, so here's a little map moving 80 miles a year. You can see the first reports of them actually attacking a potato plant where they just start swarm it in numbers, like we saw in the last picture, 1859. And within 15 years, they've already reached New York State. So, okay, this is kind of nuts to me, Tristan, because I am just now putting together, really, as you talk about it, that like the movement of this beetle is pretty well documented because it was always such a, a, a sort of like obvious pest, I guess. Um, which is, that's actually like pretty unusual because a lot of times we don't know, we don't, like the species that's causing the problem isn't identified until like a hundred years later or 50 years later or something. A lot of times we like don't realize what's happened until it's too late. And it seems like in this case, I think because the beetle is pretty distinctive looking, probably helps. In this picture, it looks like it has like some adult beetles and also some larvae or pupae or whatever they're called again. Yeah, um, there's some of both there, I think. Yeah, it's well, like a, I think these are larvae because the pupae fall down into the ground. Oh, okay. The underground. Um, do, and do you know what type of toxin it is that they're adapted to? David Dunn is asking. So specifically with this one, I don't. We're gonna skipping forward a little bit. We're gonna mm -hmm. find out that potato beetles, because they eat 
-hmm. this type of plant. They're actually evolutionarily pre-adapted to change their physiology to lots of different toxins. And so oh. they, they evolve resistance to basically every pesticide we've ever tried. They can even become resistant to cyanide in a lab. So their, their chemistry is so used to taking toxins and finding workarounds around it that anything they can, they can get an immunity to. That is great. That's nuts. Wow. What, what a problem. All right, I'm going to skip ahead. So it was a disaster. No, so this is disaster, eating everybody's potato crops. I've got a quote. They're talking about a train, you know, in uh, Iowa saying the rails were so covered with beetles that the driver wheels, the big wheels on the train couldn't get traction. And so they'd have to go out and sweep the beetles off the railroad tracks in order for it not to be so slimy with crushed beetles because there wow. just millions of them everywhere. And can I do it? Can I do a dramatic rereading of this? Sorry to interrupt you. The, the rails were covered with beetles for a mile. And after a few revolutions of the drivers, the wheels lost the friction and slipped as if oiled. They had to be swept off and the track sanded before any progress was made. That's how many potato beetles there were. They're greasing up the train tracks with their dead bodies. Ooh. Um, and then there's another quote here. So this it's hard. This looks like it's from 1865 is what this date here for the practical entomologist, a monthly bulletin. Um, I think I can read the quote that's circled in red here. It says, I took more than a gallon of bags this morning from 11 rows of potatoes, eight rods long. Eternal vigilance is the price of potatoes in this section. Ooh. Basically, I guess that means they collected a lot of bugs off the potatoes. Yeah. Wow. So eight bags of bugs from just a single row of potatoes, eight, eight rods long or something like that. Wow. And, and I so, thought my fight against the scale bugs on my fern over here was bad. Jeez. So the prices of potatoes was skyrocketing because everyone's crops were getting trashed mm -hmm. and people were getting really worried about these. They can just mow through your your farm really fast. Um, you want next slide? Yes. Yeah. Maybe so, you snap at me or something. Oh, okay. This will be fun. So if they come, they go that quickly to the edge, where are you going to go next if you're a beetle going that far? So what's on the other side of the ocean? They've marched all the way to the ocean. So uh, oh, Europe. Europe. So wait, tell me more about this. I mean, the ocean, because one might presumably say, oh, they just stopped there. Not like they crossed an ocean. Do we know like if they came across on like boats, like did they come with potatoes that were being yeah. like exported? Okay. So they, they can't fly. They're not actually that good of flyers. They can only fly a few miles and they can't hike that far. The, the issue is once they get to the ocean in the US, then they're going to be around our ports and they're going to start sneaking on to our ships and they might find some ways of, of sneaking across with the trade. So that meant Europe didn't want to lose their potato crop. They had fresh memories of the Irish potato famine just a decade or so before. Um, potatoes really were kind of, they were the crop that actually fueled the industrial revolution in the sense of the humans. Like this provided a way to get way more calories per acre than wheat or barley did. And so potatoes exploded in the 1700s, 1800s as a way of feeding lots of working class people in Europe. So they were really worried they're going to lose all these. So they shut down their borders. They're like, we're not going to import any potato related anything from America because we don't want to to risk getting these sneaking across. Wow, that's pretty, that's pretty serious. And I imagine was that like a pretty big hit to the potato farmers in the US then? Well, it was an issue. Uh, go ahead to the next one. Um, there is some interesting politics with this where, uh, like in Britain, they didn't actually ban importing potatoes because they, you know, they got some advice and they're like, okay, well, look, we know the adults don't actually live with tubers. So as long as we're only importing tubers, then we're not going to get larvae or adults. Um, and also, they were really worried they didn't want to annoy American farmers because they had to import most of their wheat from America at the time. And so, like, we can live with some risk of importing a few potatoes from America, but because we don't want to do that. 
but it did it caused you know protectionist economics really ramped up there was a lot of heated language being thrown both sides across the atlantic i've i think on the one before i've got a a quote from an old new york times article where they're just blasting the the british and trying to say this is the our revenge for the british supporting the confederate states during the civil war we're going to take out their potato crops with our superior beetles and are there superior beetles <laughs> Sorry, what a what a like a power move. Um, well, so this is interesting, right? Because it's not just like we get later to like the propag the propaganda in Europe about this that it's like an attack from America, but in some ways there's also like people in America. It sounds like that are like yeah, wanting to like almost like take credit for the potato beetles destruction. I guess. Yeah, I guess they kind of feel if the destruction is going to happen, then better take out those that we're angry with, probably. And people yeah. sometimes like to bring other people down to your destruction. Um, I also mentioned how it it was a, a big topic of debate in Britain because um, some of their interpretation of Darwinian evolution at the time was they thought that more fit and evolved things should naturally displace more primitive things. And they interpreted that to also mean Europe is the most civilized, cultured place on the planet. So, of course, everything that lives in Europe is going to naturally displace all of these provincial stuff. And then this potato beetle is threatening that because it's from the colonies, it's from the provinces, and yet it can completely undermine the economics of, of food in Europe. And they're like, what are we supposed to do? You know, this this isn't supposed to work that way. We're supposed to naturally just always outcompete anything from the colonies. Um, and yet they weren't, and yet they didn't feel that like taking the potatoes from like the new world, <laughs> quote unquote, because <laughs> that's why the potato beetle came. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's like our potatoes and our beetles are better. Take that. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> um, but yeah, to be very clear, like, yeah, everything Tristan about Tristan just said is wrong about true, true, you yeah. Know, true, I'm not he's, yeah he's that. Like, these are, you know, common misconceptions of the time. I, I think like everyone, like like most people know that, but just so that most of our viewers are like nerds, I don't know, in this particular regard and understand that, but just to be clear. Yeah. I'd rather not show up clipped on some other show as being the racist professor from Arizona. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so moving, I, people still publish weird stuff like this sometimes. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, palette cleanser, YouTube comment um, from David Howden, who's um, a naturalist in the UK. I, he's, um, he's saying that he thinks besides Lepidoptera, he only knows of, um, in terms of like the crossing the ocean, I guess, the only other non-human assisted bug crossing he knows of is the dragonfly. Um, so I think, yeah, probably beetles in general are not that great of, not good enough flyers ever to cross the ocean. Yeah. yeah There's those good. front wings, they've evolved to be nice little tank-like shields, but it means they really can't fly well because when they want to fly, they have to lift up their elytra, which are basically like flaps that just slow them down. And then they try to flap their hind wings as fast as they can. So they just <laughs> they can't do the acrobatics that dragonflies or flies or butterflies can do. Yeah, I see. They've sacrificed like their flight power for the shielding, basically, when it comes to their wings. Interesting. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, okay, should I move on the slides? Yeah. Uh, Europe freaked out. Continuing xenophobia. Oh, this is, I think, what you were yeah. talking about. Yeah. yeah. So oh. just fans, lots of xenophobia. We can move forward. We already talked about these. Yeah. What is, wait, what is this picture showing? They're like spraying, yeah. you know, what's happening in this. Yeah, so it's a, you know, an invasion. They're trying to spray Paris green as one of the old, old timey pesticides. It was a mixture of arsenic and copper that they like to use. And so these guys, it's like, you know, flamethrowers on the beaches of, of the cliffs of Dover and they're spraying Paris green to try to fight back. You can see beetles on the far right side invading. Oh, I, oh, I see. These are like, be yeah, these kind of these shadowy figures are beetles. Hang on, let me change the change this for a moment so people can see the beetles better. Yeah, the these beetles over here are like, Wah! anyways, that's my 
impression of them. Um, yeah, it was interesting. I saw it said green on the side of the thing and I was like, why does it say green? So Paris green was originally, it's a paint. It was a color of paint that they liked doing. And there was a farmer in, I forgot where, like Illinois or something who realized that the extra paints when he was painting his, his barn killed the bugs and kept them from doing it. So they realized, oh, okay, we can use this to kill things. Of course, it's arsenic, you know, it's incredibly toxic. It's poisoned our soils for the last century now, but they would spray it everywhere to try to kill stuff. That's nuts, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, gentlemen, goes to your comment, you're exactly right. They just hitch a ride on international shipping. So they just, you know, people are shipping potatoes and other things all around and, um, and that's how they got around. It still happens to this day that, you know, lots of invasive species and stuff are accidentally spread that way. That's how I think mosquitoes got to a lot of islands, for example, where they weren't before because mosquito is another example of a weak flyer. Um, and that's been a big problem, but we could go on and on. Yeah. So basically that is bad and was bad and continues to be bad. Yeah. Um, um, but so yeah. Europe actually managed to hold the line and keep them from invading. If you do quarantines with new shipping goods, if you do inspections at ports, then you can often try to find these pests. And so that's why we do this. The problem is that I bring up several times in my class, wars distract people. And when you've got thousands of people fleeing an area and you're trying to make sure you get enough food to feed your troops and enough material and supplies, you're not going to be busy checking every crevice to see if there's a beetle hiding somewhere. And so you just let stuff through without inspecting it as carefully in the time of war. And that's what happened here, where uh, the American troops going over to France in World War I, you know, where do we find after World War I, right outside of those port cities the Americans had been using, potato beetles had made us a beachhead and they managed to establish themselves in Europe. So they managed to keep them away for like 40 years, but then World War I, uh, all the distractions with all these countries roaming around fighting each other, let this pest through. Yeah, they had bigger, bigger things on their mind. Um, so it continues. So this shows like, I don't know if people can see the numbers, but yeah, this, oh, this is the point of origin here, like 19... 21 it looks like is the first year is that like when they first started to notice it like in fields or on potatoes in the wild i see yeah so the war ended 1918 and just three years later they're starting to notice it out in the fields surrounding already yeah and then this this latest this lightest shade slash latest date i'm really struggling with my enunciation is 1964 out here so by 1964 it had um it had spread pretty much throughout europe yeah. and so you can see it's spreading you know about the same rate as it was in the us where it just naturally is going to march and fly and spread a little bit on its own it took a few decades to crawl all the way across europe though and unfortunately by the time it crawled the hundreds of miles eastward it takes to make it to eastern europe the world had changed. We'd gone through another world war. Cold War had started. Iron Curtain fallen down. And so it's starting to reach uh, Soviet controlled countries right around the time of the early 1950s and 1960s, like you saw on that map. Yeah. And so that coincidence. Uh, <laughs> dun, dun, dun. So coincidence. the Soviets <laughs> blamed the US and they're like, this beetle is showing up. Potatoes are really important to you know, Russian cuisine. And, you know, they had a lot of this stuff saying that they thought the Americans were to blame for bringing these beetles and trying to undermine good Soviet farmers and the Soviet way of life. Um, yeah, and I, my point is, it doesn't, it's not true. It doesn't need to be true. You know, why ascribe to malice what can be explained through uh, just con convenience? You know, it's incompetence. The beetle had just been moving 10 years every decade or so, or 10, 10 miles every year. And so right around the same time is when it starts showing up. But that coincidence, it was so easy. You could politicize and say, these are the Americans trying to undermine our way of life. Let's blame them and try to fight this beetle. So do you think that people knew that it wasn't quite true or, cause it also seems like something that would be like genuinely easy to mix up. You know what I mean? 
well, it starts showing up right around the same time. So you're going to have those correlated in, in your mind, you know, and like you see in that children's book where there a lot of a lot of the propaganda was suggesting that maybe these American planes are dropping the Beatles. And so it's a nice way to explain and to have people uh, be suspicious of spy planes. We'd have lots of spy planes flying mm -hmm. over Soviet states. Some of them are repurposed bombers. It could easily be thought of, of oh, these spy planes are out there trying to seed Beatles onto it. Did everybody, I mean, I, I imagine some Soviet entomologists probably knew it wasn't true, but. Uh, yeah, I see. But most people probably thought this really was the case. And then, yeah, I think I, I just think it's an interesting distinction to make because it's like, it's propaganda in that it's like a widely circulated thing that's not true, but it's also kind of like, there's maybe less intention behind it than people might otherwise assume, right? If that makes sense. And yeah. um, are you I able know to- many Russians genuinely believe it too. Right after I shared these a few weeks ago, I had several friend, Russian friends share that, yeah, they'd heard that from their grandmother. They, or, you know, their ex-wife still believed it, or, you know, there's still lots of Russians who know this to this day. And they think that the Colorado potato beetle, the Americans, deliberately tried to infect Russia with it. Oops. Um, yeah, I think that that's really, I mean, that's, we have all kinds of misconceptions. I'm sure I have all kinds of misconceptions. It just kind of happens. Are you able to read this text here in the picture? Uh, um, that one I don't know because that looks like Czech. Uh -oh, uh, never unfortunately. Mind. I like how happy these two are here. This one's like laying eggs on the underside of the leaf and this one's like, yeah, go for it, honey. Our babies, <laughs> like it's for such like an evil beetle. These depictions of them are surprisingly like sort of humane, I guess. You know, like they look kind of cute and stuff. At least they do to me here. Maybe that's my own bias of thinking that animals are cool. But um, yeah, I guess like these beetles are getting dropped off by the plane, and they're just happy. They're like, look at this plant. It looks like a great place to raise a family, honey. And the other one's like, yep, here we go. Uh, cool. Okay, let me get this zoomed out a little bit. So this is some some examples of the Soviet propaganda you were just talking about. Um, and as you say here, okay, so you're giving us a little preview um, about check, keeping out for sort of like American iconography in these posters. So there's like, they're associating, you know, red, white, and blue, stars, stripes, dollar signs, FDR, um, which is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And we have a, a very broad audience as well. Yes. Um, Uncle Sam, good old American Uncle Sam with, and that they're being associating these like US centric images with the Beatles and the war, the death um, destruction that they kind of brought with them. So, oops, let me switch back to, oh yeah. So here's like just the posters um which oh no let's go back to this view yeah, yeah. so, so there we see in east germany and stuff you know all this horde of beetles with american flags on them because it's like the stripes and so they're saboteurs getting coming across the border the plane with the american flag on its tail dropping the beetles um american beetles they're calling them the war against the beetle um keep going forward through a few more of these yeah we have a comment david dunn says the beatles invaded the u.s oh wait that was the wrong beatles yeah we had a two-way beetle exchange yeah um oh and a, a this is a, an important question from gentleman get ghost i guess as we think about like the context for some of these posters like was the impact of the beatles to the point of crop failure i haven't heard of famines in the 1950s um yeah, like were people like going hungry because of these beetles or is it more like people losing money? Um, I mean, um, yeah. Yeah, so there weren't, I, I don't know of any widespread famines due to this one either. Luckily, by this time we had other pesticides you could use too. And so they're spraying lots and lots of pesticides to try to control them. If they hit your crop, you will lose your, your crop for the first few years. And so we've partly had to develop ways of farming to work around the beetle um and so we've if you if you rotate your crops every year then that helps because then the beetle population can't build up to the levels that will actually destroy your whole crop and your 
And so that helps if you have refuges, then you can actually use um, some pesticides better. So the, it didn't totally wipe them out and make thousands of people starve, but it did make it much harder to grow potatoes. And uh, it's, if you don't have any defenses, then it, it could definitely lose a, a, a nice, cheap, easy way of getting calories. Yeah, so it sounds like it was just like a real struggle. Like they were able to kind of prevent like famine level crop failure, but it was like a real struggle for the farmers and, and, and from a management perspective to do that. Yeah, like lots of pesticides and yeah, bringing in different tactics, like you said. Um, and yeah, also, David, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in the context, a few decades after, I mean, Russia and Ukraine had had especially problems with when they first started collectivizing with the, the Soviet farm system and so they had famine the whole more and and other famines there when they're forcing people to start doing the collective farms with other parts of eastern europe at this point then they're starting to try to get people to buy into those too and so it uh this caused extra friction with that whole system of trying to get these farms going i see yeah. a question about what caused the great potato famine of ireland that's actually a mold um so not an insect related one Oh, well, I, I was actually just going to Google because I was like, oh, Tristan might know, not know that one. I'm going to like find out the answer and then I'll bring up the question later. But you spotted it and brought it up yourself. So good job. A mold. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of the potato problems like that were because they didn't have that many different varieties of potatoes. So like when you just have like one species of t potato that you're growing, whereas is like in Peru and wherever they have like, you know, dozens of species um, it can be harder because you don't have like as much of a mon monoculture. It can be harder for like one mold to be like, um, anyways, is the, the official noise that a mold makes as it's, <laughs> as it's spreading exponentially throughout a crop oh, population. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. But these, okay. Back to these propaganda posters. Cause I'm looking at them and I'm like, wow, people hated these beetles and still do. So like, there's this guy. Um, you have some more, these ones are like very clearly. <laughs> Halt the American beetle. Yeah. You know, a death hand dropping the beetles onto your potato crops, but it's got the stars and stripes on it. Yeah. I, oh, finally there, this is better. Yeah. So there's those, um, and here's there's, a whole bunch. <laughs> yeah. This, I just, I just totally stole this without asking you because we're such good friends that I can steal your intellectual property. I stole this for the. So I think like, I'm wrong. Huh? I was just saying, I, I'm realizing, I think I'm wrong. That's, that's Truman, isn't it? Actually not. FDR. Here, that's, I think so. The caption um, there says a mission and, you know, a I'm, mission I'm, from the White House. So they're saying like the American president is sending you off these beetles off equipped to go do a secret agent mission. Oh, wait, how can you see the caption? Or did you previously look at the cap? Or is it this caption here? No, sorry, above it on, on the top left one. Uh, wait, under here? The top left one with the guy with the glasses. Yeah. There's some Russian words right above it. Oh, I see. Okay. And that's what says, what does it say again? It says a, a mission from the White House. Okay. Oh, I see. Interesting. Um, the bottom right, you know, they're suggesting that American MPs, military police um, in the Cold War are, are like these beetles that are going to go there. They're likening America dropping beetles on one side and dropping bombs in the Korean War at the same time in the 50s. Wait a second. Wait, like, let's hold on. This is a lot. I'm like, this is nuts. So these hats say MP. Okay, so these are like American military police, and they're confronting what, like an innocent beetle here with an umbrella. What's happening? <laughs> well, they're just trying to show this. You're trying to teach this idea that you can't trust the American military police. You can't trust, you know, they, they say they're coming here to try to help keep peace, but they're just going to, they're like beetles. They're going to get in there, and then they're just going to go and, and take over. I see. Wait, and what year are these posters from? We have a question. I'm not sure. I need to double check that. I would guess most of them are from the 50s, especially the one with Korean War stuff in the bottom left definitely looks like 50s. Oh, yeah. There's Korea. Let me see if I saved that in my file. Interesting. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and here this, I'm not quite sure how well you can see, especially if you're like watching on a phone or something, but this is, you know, Uncle Sam, an American flag. And instead of stars on the flag, there's all these beetles here. Um, yeah, it's intense. I'll go through. Yeah, I think these ones are maybe my favorite because they're the, the most colorful. <laughs> Um, yeah, we can always add as, as a comment later, like what year, but it's yeah. like on the ballpark too. Um, oh yeah, Dave, uh, we have a comment that Truman, oh yeah, that's Truman then because he was president from 45 to 53. Makes sense. Okay. Um, so those are very cool propaganda posters. And so then here I'm just as we revisit this, just this idea again of the ecological bomb, you know, I, I can't, you know, the beetle kept on marching all the way across Russia. It's now starting to get close to the borders of China and India, which are actually the two largest producers of potatoes nowadays. And so their crops are now starting to have to prepare and plan for what are you going to do when the potato beetle starts reaching them. And this is a hundred years after World War I opened the gates to Eurasia getting the potato beetle. I can't imagine anybody actually fighting in World War I thinking that there would still be consequences like this a hundred years later of who assassinates whom, where do you go to war, all that. You're going to cause crop failures hundreds of miles away potentially because of these actions. So we need to, I, I feel like I, I try to encourage people just there's long-term consequences to our decisions that we don't always see. And these ecological bombs can have ripples that last for hundreds of years. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, Should well, we skip forward to the Russia stuff? Yeah, yeah I was going to say, I think it might be, as we're coming up in an hour here, yeah. oh, this is also, this is the Paris green pesticide you mentioned again. Wow, I feel like I'm becoming such an expert. Um, I'm like, oh yeah, Paris green, that's like a pesticide they used to use. It was based on the, a paint that some farmer realized was toxic to beetles. Anyways, um... <laughs> Why is he painting his barn green? Anyways, um, sorry, you would like to skip to, do you want to talk about insecticide resistance or? Uh, they they become resistant. If you use insecticides, <laughs> they will eventually evolve resistance. It's mathematically going to happen. Um. This is just, this is funny to me because um, whenever I talk about like evolution by, um, like pre-existing um, genetic like diversity or like pre-adaptive stuff. I like do this exact same thing. I just have like different colors of some organism and I'm like, look, <laughs> you know, like mostly this, like this color survives better. And anyways, I guess that's just how we do it. Um, so current day, is this where you want to start? Yeah, or let's go to here just so we can have some, some modern thing to so in the 50s and 60s, the Colorado potato beetle became the symbol of American imperialism. And so lots of people growing up in the Soviet Union have this mental link of Colorado potato beetle and imperialist people trying to mess us up. That's what they had. 2014, though, we start to see this show up again because as the Russia-Ukraine conflict heats up more, the orange and black stripes on the Colorado potato beetle look a lot like the orange and black stripes on this ribbon, the Order of St. George, that the Russians use to celebrate their, their military. It's like the, the yellow support the troops ribbon that Americans use. Uh, so it shows up everywhere. If you go to you know Russian cemeteries and memorials, there's just everything covered in orange and black ribbons. And this, sorry, this predates the beetle, the, the beetle coming to Russia. Yeah, the, the order is 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 old. It's a World War II one is the main one that most of them are using it, but it's 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 much older than that. Mm -hmm. And so Ukrainians, when Russians started sending uh, mercenaries and people over the border into the Donbas area to start insurrections there and take the Crimea and and do lots of of uh, actions there, Ukrainians saw this as another imperialist invader coming over and messing them up. And so they had that link of the Colorado potato beetle. So they, I, I saw several of these memes where uh, Colorado potato beetles became a 
stand in for Russians in Ukraine. So Colorado was one way of, of you seeing memes where they're referring to, to Russians that way. I see. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I'm looking forward to to some of those memes, but yeah, are you? um, And well, like real quick, like so, you lived in Russia for a couple years. Do you care to talk about at all, like either why you were there or what you learned while you were there, how it like changed your perspective? Or we don't have to if you don't want to, because I I don't know what your thoughts on this are. We've never talked about it, but (laughs) yeah. um, So I've always been interested in in Russia and. Slavic cultures and stuff. I started learning Russian in high school because I loved literature and I wanted to learn another foreign language. And so I started taking classes. Um, then, so I took like eight classes in college with with Russian language and literature and stuff. Um, and I got to go there for two years where I was actually there as a Mormon missionary because I used to be Mormon. Um, and so we were living in the middle I was living in the middle of Russia, um, on the Ural Mountains area. And it was, it was really nice because it, well, it wasn't all really nice, (laughs) but it's amazing how nice people are and how so many people, like, I know my parents were scared that I was going off to Russia, um, Mm -hmm. their children of the cold war. Right. And to just go there and live with people and get to know each other of, Oh, You know, we're just people, we're all just people, we're good people, we're all just trying to do the best we can. You know, politically, we've had lots of leaders that have made us hate each other for lots of reasons, but we're just people living. That was, that was precious, you know, it's nice. Um, There's a lot of anti-American sentiment there, and so it's kind of dangerous to live sometimes. Uh, It was cold, but where I grew up is also pretty cold, so at least it wasn't orders of magnitude worse um yeah we have a comment about amazing that the beatles shrugged off the russian winters yeah that's actually one of the cool things why we haven't been able to have any good biological control for the potato beetle because Mm -hmm. since the species evolved in northern mexico southern rocky areas all of its natural predators are actually not as good in colder climates and so they they're not good you can't take the native parasites and parasitoids and predators of the Colorado potato beetle from Mexico and have them live in Siberia. They, they're just not going to work there. And so we haven't been able to use biological control methods for this pest very much. That's really interesting. Yeah, the beetle can survive the Russian winters, but their predators can't. Ugh, they've escaped their enemies. Um, yeah, I didn't think of that. I do kind of remember. I mean, yeah, we so Tristan and I, when we met, we were both living in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where I am now. And um, yeah, I do remember that like in winter, you just like really looked like you had it down. Like you had like your big like furry hat and like you looked like a Russian. I think you like picked up some like winter dressing tips from your time there. Oh, yeah. I, I remember my first winter there, I actually experimented with how to tie your scarf so that way you wouldn't have any chinks in your neck to get let air in. Because sometimes I remember, you know, we had minus 40 degrees and in one city. I was in one city in western Siberia called Surgut. And it was minus 40. You can only be outside for like 15 minutes before your skin starts to freeze. And so we'd have to plan out, okay, how are you going to, we have to walk across the city, you know, we could walk for 15 minutes to hear, stop by and visit somebody we know, say hi with them, warm up, have a cup of tea, go over, stop by this little shop, get a candy bar, warm up, then we'll make it to our spot. And so you have to plan out your route strategically when it's that cold out and, you know, wear lots of layers. I wear eight layers on top and like five layers on bottom to stay warm. That is nuts. Um, Okay, well, like, I'm like totally, I feel like we talked about this at the time and now I'm just like re-remembering it all. Like that's just, what a way to live. I mean, and I'm sure that that like, it was just really shaped like your economy and stuff like that to some degree, right? It's like, oh, like all the little snack shops are like, ha it's like everyone's gonna have to be stopping in like on their way from one place to another and, and whatever. It's interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so the, your takeaway. So you, okay, with that background, in mind um yeah you want to give us and well and also there's also a video that you shared which i don't want to skip over the video 
Um, we are like coming up on like an hour here, but we have, I don't know if people, if I play the video, if people are going to be able to hear the sound. Um, okay. But we can, we cer I certainly want to try that. And I want to talk about Ukraine and Russia. So which, which would you like to do first? Um, I might recommend doing this first and then, okay. so that way, if there's people who have to run after an hour, they can still get some of the... Okay. Yeah, you could that good. All right. So, so why is bad blood? Oh, here, I'm just, you know, bringing up, you know, this has been very convenient that I had these slides already ready, but a lot of us are getting a crash course in Ukrainian history. Ukraine's actually much older than Russia. Kiev was the largest country in, in Europe for hundreds of years. Um, it was, Kiev was is much older than Moscow, but when the Mongols invaded, uh, they burned much of, Kiev and Rus down, and then Moscow, which was a little border town, made some deals with the Golden Horde and rose in power and were able to take control. So Kiev and Russia and Moscow have, have traditionally for a thousand years kind of vied over leadership of Slavic people and what is Rus, what is Russia. Um, so Russia then at different times has controlled different parts of Ukraine. They used Crimea, which is that province we've all heard about a lot. Um, they used it as one of their main ports for hundreds of years. Um, but parts of Kyiv were like there was an independent uh, Cossack state. Other parts were controlled by Prussia or Poland or the Lithuanians or other different empires over the years. And so there's they fought back and forth over that land um, for a while. Eventually, if you go to the next slide, by the um, hundred years ago, Russia absorbed most of the rest of, of Ukraine. Um, why bad blood? You know, there's lots of reasons of bad blood. A couple I bring up here, 1920s, like I mentioned, with the move to set up collective communist farms, uh, the Soviets actually engineered a famine that killed millions and millions of people. There were millions of people in Russia that died from it, but especially in Ukraine, because that was one of the main agricultural productions. And so uh, this was a really stupid uh, plan to let's deliberately destroy a lot of our food and then millions of people will die, but that will force them to join our system. Um, eventually, by the 90s, when the USSR broke up, Ukraine got independence as its own state. We've learned all sorts of details about that in the last few weeks of, you know, they agreed to have their own state if they got rid of their nukes and... Uh, back and forth. Russia has tried to keep a lot of control of Ukraine, though, because they see him as a, a border country. And so they uh, they want that buffer zone around them. Um, and so Yanukovych was one of the presidents of Ukraine. Uh, Americans might have heard of him before because Paul Manafort, who was Trump's President Trump's campaign manager, worked for Yanukovych before he worked for Trump. Um, he was a very corrupt leader who was totally just a puppet of Putin in, in, in there. And so he'd actually already in the Orange Revolution back in 2005, he'd been convicted of election fraud and thrown off the ballot. But then later he got elected. And so then Ukrainians finally got fed up with him 2013, 2014, and they kicked him out. And so then Russia got worried that they're going to lose control of Ukraine and of these things because they got rid of their Russian leaning president. And so Putin invaded, took the Crimea, annexed that, and sent thousands of troops over to the Donbas areas in order to keep those areas always unstable. So that way Ukraine wasn't able to, to cement its position there. So, you know, I mentioned that's why the Ukrainian aid was a whole deal in the first Trump impeachment, because Americans were withholding that aid unless the Ukrainians did President Trump a personal favor. Um, this was this whole issue where Ukraine is now trying to figure out where is it going to have its um, future. Is its future tied with Russia? Or is its future tied with the rest of Europe? Um, and these mass protests are suggesting lots of Ukrainians there. I, I actually lived with a few Ukrainians when I was living in Russia. One of my companions was from Kyiv. Um, I lived with him for about six months. Um, and he you know, the, he spoke fluent Russian. He was completely fluent in Russian, but he was very proud of being Ukrainian. Um, and uh, 
So this has been a, a very difficult time because I have so many Russian and Ukrainian friends and they both, they're used to being uh, brother people, but now all of a sudden there's an invasion and Ukrainians don't want to be annexed into Russia. And a lot of the Russians just assume that the Ukrainians want to, and they, they're, they're not going along with that. Um, Interesting. Yeah. I was going to ask you, cause I didn't have a good feel for like what people in Russia thought, like what the average person in Russia thinks about all this or what their perspective is. Yeah. Um, uh, well, it's hard to know because a lot of them, a don't they, see it. talk about it publicly. Um, yeah. it, it's most Russians, you know, for hundreds of years, they've learned you don't say stuff publicly because you can get in trouble that way. Um, you know, if you get to know them as an actual friend and they can trust you that you're not going to blab, then, uh, you know, over tea at their house, then you might actually be able to have a conversation, but, uh, you know, I, I have several Russian friends who've been sharing anti-war things lately on social media as their way of trying to say they're not actually for invading Ukraine, but also many of them are either totally quiet or uh, have totally bought into the, we're bringing them home, they're going to be very happy to join us. So I've, I've seen all flavors of response from my Russian friends. Uh, my Ukrainian friends are all, you know, fully to a person very uh, ticked off that this is happening and upset about their families and trying to find polite words of saying. I know, I was like, Tristan, you are the most polite person ever. Um, I know, yeah, sometimes politeness uh, can, uh, lack of politeness can be excused or is even preferable <laughs> sometimes, yeah. but yes. I mean, it's been, I've, you know, I've, I've had one family I know that luckily made it out early and so they're in safety now. Two other families I know that were stuck in Kyiv and just recently have managed to make it out of Kyiv. You know, the husbands are still having to fight, but they're trying to get their kids and their wives and their grandparents so they don't get blown up. So they're sending those. Um, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to bring that up. I was trying to look, I was trying to shuffle through my tabs to see um, the comments from people. Whoa, we have. Um, you got somebody who's who's definitely. Yeah, that's fine. No, that's fine. I'm just looking at the comments. Um, we'll worry about that later. But yeah, I. Um, Do you mind just clicking through to the next two? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, in 2014, once Russia started uh, sending people over, I started seeing these memes show up with the Colorado potato beetle, and so here's one from 2014, where it says Colorado potato beetles, they believe in their own great mission. And so the things that these beetles are saying is they're saying fascism won't get through. We're protecting the crop from those that will harm it. We are the pr protectors of the potatoes. Um, and so this is obviously ironic because potato beetles are not going to protect potatoes. They're there to eat the potatoes, but the potato beetles believe in their own great mission that they are there and by virtue of how they protect it, they actually will consume it. Um, so as a way to try to sarcastically talk about the Russians and how they were portraying themselves in Ukraine. Um, then the next one, uh, we see, if you scroll down. So this one, it, it says the geographic distribution of the Colorado potato beetle in Ukraine. And then each one of those panels is a different city in Ukraine. Um, and so you can see the preponderance and the success of the beetles is linked to what areas we have. So Crimea, Krim is that top right one. It's completely covered with potato beetles because the Russians had annexed it and completely overrun it. But places like Kyiv in the bottom left and Dnieper um, that we're hearing about right now, you know, those are places where they're, well, Dnieper had been a, a fight just before this meme came out where they'd defeated a bunch of the separatist uh, fighters and so they were fighting them back. So you see the spider is eating a potato beetle. And in the bottom left with Kiev, you see uh, an assassin bug is eating a potato beetle. And so that showing that these other insects are going to fight back these, these Russian potato beetle invaders. But in Crimea, they were overwhelmed. And then Donetsk and Kharkiv 
um, you can see that there's lots of these potato beetles that they're starting to breed and they're starting to expand. Yeah, wait a second. Sorry, I was slow to catching on the fact that we were talking about like top left and whatever here and not like here. So I was like, what yeah. is happening? So wait, sorry, could you, what's the translation for, what is this saying up here again? So it says the geographic distribution of the Colorado uh, beetle. Okay, I see. I see. Okay. So like in some areas it gets its ass kicked and in other areas, I see it's doing well. Now, now, now it all makes sense. Okay. So these yeah. are just another example of humans actually use insect propaganda a lot. We use it as a way to other other people and to try to make them seem less than human. We also use it as a way of connecting emotionally with people. And so if we can say that so and so is a beetle, then it's a way of, you know, this can stick with you more than if they had just faces of humans there, perhaps. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of people, when you use a metaphor, including insect metaphors, it helps provide emotional distance. And that emotional distance can be used for like, good or bad, right? Like it can give you emotional distance from something that maybe you feel too self-conscious about to think about directly, like, oh, I feel shy or something. You know what I mean? To process something um, in a way that's more neutral, or it can be used for bad to like, as you said, like sort of dehumanize um, or something like that. Um, there is, sorry, we have a question. Um, I missed the midpoint. Is this particular beetle different, more advanced to survive compared to other beetles? I think it's just that like, when whenever you have an, an invasive species, like a species that starts to spread, um, how advanced it is or not kind of starts to change. Because like when it's in its native, like natural habitat, then it's like probably like not superior, quote unquote, to anything else around really, because it's part of like an ecosystem that has checks and balances. But when this beetle spread, it became um, superior, more advanced, I guess you could say in some ways, because it, as Tristan was talking about, it doesn't have its natural predators. Um, it's, some of its predators maybe had trouble surviving the winters and it had all this great potato food that a lot of other insects probably hadn't figured out how to take advantage of to quite the same degree. Um, so I think that's maybe what you're getting, what, what your question is, gentlemen ghost. Um, Tristan, do you have anything to add? No, that's good. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, and in this propaganda, yeah, specifically, it's kind of like, in some cases, the beetle is doing really well, but in other areas, it's like able to get like, pushed back. Yeah. Right. Now I'm forgetting. So far, I haven't seen any new, so then that's it. From there. Okay. I haven't seen any new memes with Colorado potato beetles with this latest flare up since mm. 2021 or 2022. Um, but I'm trying to keep my eye out for them. Yeah. Uh, All right, everyone, that's your homework. Keep your eye out for Colorado potato beetle memes um, wherever you may be in the world. I think we still have some people from Europe at least watching. So maybe they'll be some sightings there. Okay, to close, I guess let's try and play this video that you shared. Um, and I think it has captions that translate on its own. And so you, oh, okay. even if you can't hear it, it might actually work that way. All right, let me try to turn on the, it, it does have captions. Okay. All right. I'm just going to um, play. Let's see if this works.
Ti, kdo k nám tohoto žravého brouka poslali, počítali s tím, že si najde, že vyčiníká cestu k našim bramborám. Počítali, že bude nenafitně žrát to, co roste pro nás. Počítali, že naklade tisíce vajíček, že se z vajíček vyjít na čové larky. Co chtějí američtí imperialisté? Chtějí, aby nejnebezpečnější škůdce brambor zničil naše vyspělé bramborářství, aby byla podvázána naše výživa, živočišná výroba i průmysl, pro který jsou brambory surovinou. Tyto žravé larvy, to je kultura atomových válečných paličů. Jenomže páni imperialisté dělali účet bez hostinského. Počítali a zase se přepočítali. Naše vláda učinila rázná opatření. Rázná opatření k odražení podlého útoku našich nepřátel. A to už by mohli i na západě vědět. U nás je odstop k činům blízko. My všichni a především vládež, pioníři se dáváme do boje. Najdeme každého amerického brouka a zničíme. Každé místo výskytu dezinfikujeme. Každé místo nálezu řádně označíme. Zapojíme techniku do boje proti škůdci. Dáváme všechny síly do boje za záchranu plodů naší práce. To je naše bezprostřední obrana proti útoku našich nepřátel. Necháme je zakupit po zemi. I tady je dopadneme a zničíme. To je naše odpověď nepřátelským útočníkům. Vypořádali jsme se s Borákovou, Peclem a společní. Vypořádáme se i s mandelínkou Bramborovou, americkým broukem. Ubráníme a očistíme naše pole, naši úrodu od americké nákazy. Cizí nechceme, ale své nedáme. Wow. Wow. We should have watched that first. That was nuts. Yeah, it's not amazing. That I feel like they did all that to get rid of this beetle. I feel like I there's like no hope for me trying to get rid of the scale bugs on my one fern. Like I could just give up now if insects can survive that kind of directed attack. Like there's just no hope. Um well, yeah, I mean that's it, everyone. That is a wrap. Thank you so much to everyone in the audience for joining us. Um, thank you especially so, so much to Tristan. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. And um, it's been really great catching up with you. And thank you so much for educating us. Um, the last, I think like the last comment I probably have, oh, and I just put the link, the YouTube link to the video we just watched in the chat if anyone wants to see it um, again. Um, the last thing I kind of have is, you know, on the topic of Ukraine, I know that a lot of people have been wanting to help, to donate, to support in some way. I've seen um, online where there's opportunities, there's like a whole, like in academia, there's a whole list of like labs. Like if you want to do a master's or you're looking for a technician position, like labs that you can um, that they're encouraging like Ukrainians, like refugees to apply to, um, to try to help, you know, find like work other places. Um, do you, I have a, an article to a link of like a site to donate or like th that's about like donating to Ukraine. But Tristan, do you have any like thoughts on like how to help? I don't have any concrete ones to share. Um, yeah. We have just been working, uh, trying to help people I know and yeah. and get funds to get out of the country um but yeah but I, yeah i do have a couple links and there is this one article i liked because it doesn't it's not like here's where to donate to but it's like here's how to go about like thinking about where to donate and stuff like that and it does you know for example it's like donate to organizations other than people unless it's like people you know you know what i mean and so um I know that you've shared stuff, Tristan, for like people who you know or who are like friends of friends, um, which is certainly, yeah, certainly understandable because, um, yeah, when I've had friends in countries that are going through um, natural or human caused disasters, that's like <laughs> the first place I go to is like how to help the people I know. Um, so I definitely, yeah, check out the link I put in the chat too. Mm -hmm. One other thing I would also just invite people is 
remember not to let yourself demonize Russians, all Russians, because of what is, you know, because their country has chosen to invade another country doesn't mean everybody who's associated with Russia is evil. Um, there are millions of wonderful humans who are living there. They shouldn't all be painted with the same brush. Um, this is a horrible thing. We should also question some of our own assumptions. You know, why, uh, why do we feel kinship with some people and not with others? We should where you think about what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be part of this brotherhood of, of life? And I, I think it's inspiring to see how people have tried to to rally with some of that. But I, I think we could also show us how we can do better and be worry, more concerned about other other people too. Yeah, that is that's really beautiful closing sentiments, Tristan. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, as always, on our journey of learning and understanding. I'll see you all same time, same place next week. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.